Um, hopefully you're all here for starting and selling an AI company. Uh, Ramesh is in cohort eight and uh, we're gonna hear from him how he started and sold his AI company and what he looks for as an investor now when he's um, investing in AI startups and other types of, of, of companies. But Ramesh, before we start, just tell us a little bit about yourself. So let us know kind of prior to you starting your startups and selling them, what, what you've mm -hmm. been up to. Mm -hmm. Sure. So um, I grew up in, I was born in India. I grew up there, um, moved, to the, uh, moved to the US for my university uh, when I was 18, um, studied computer science in, uh, in, at the University of Illinois, uh, which is sort of uh, in the middle, middle of the US. Um, and um, I really, really enjoyed computer science uh, as, as a university student, but I also uh, did, an, uh, did an internship uh, at Microsoft when I was in, in university. And that's when I realized I didn't want to do, be doing um, computer programming full time. I liked, I liked technology. And so after I, so, but I wanted, I was more, I was always more interested in the big picture. And, and also at that time, instead of being, um, being a, being a full-time computer programmer, um, meant you were working on a very small part of a bigger project. So the, so sort of the impact a single programmer could have, especially in a bigger company like Microsoft was pretty minimal. So I wanted to uh, have a bigger picture view of things. So I moved, so I um, decided, okay, I'll, let, me, let me try uh, some friends of mine were in, uh, in technology consulting and consulting. Let me try my hand at consulting. So after graduating, I landed up working for a large management consulting company uh, in New York. Uh, very quickly realized uh, that was not for me because um, in that environment, if you were, uh, if you came up with your own ideas, you were considered, um, you were considered naive. You were considered smart and sophisticated if you could criticize other people's ideas and come up with all the different ways, you know, something could go wrong. So that was not the right environment for me. This was the, this was the mid nineties. Some of my friends who had moved to Silicon Valley uh, were, had become, were working on super exciting things, super exciting projects. Um, so I sort of got bitten by the startup bug quite early on. So in the, um, in the late nineties, I landed up moving to the Valley, landed up joining a friend startup at, as employee number eight. And since then for the last uh, 25 years or so, I've just been doing startups either, uh, either as an entrepreneur or an investor. Nice. No, that's good. Yeah. So what we're going to do, team, is we're going to have roughly sort of 30 minutes of presentation from Ramesh, and then we can do the Q&A. But if you've got questions as we're going through, feel free to pop them in the chat as you are thinking of them so that you're a member. And uh, Ramesh may cover them during the uh, conversation or we'll go into it at the end. Um, Ramesh has sort of said he can go down deep in three different types of areas. So we can either go down deep into what he invests in, you can actually go quite technical in AI if there's any questions down there, or actually in sort of challenges and um, you know how it's, what it's like to actually work in a startup and be a tech startup. So uh, Ramesh, over to you. You can share your screen and we'll get going. Okay. Can you, uh, can you all can see my yep. screen? Okay, good. So I'll, I'll, I was, as, as Michelle said, I was, I was thinking of uh, going over the story of my last startup, which was called Paraquete Labs, uh, the different approaches we used, uh, the, the challenges we faced, and, um, the, and then go, in, go more into the general challenges startups, any startups building AI applications will face. Uh, after that, I was thinking of covering some of the uh, investments I've made. I picked three AI companies that I've invested in recently, and I thought I would uh, go over uh, why I invested in those companies and as an, uh, as an, as an early stage investor, uh, what, I'm looking, uh, what I'm looking for in, uh, in startups, in, in, in more specifically in, uh, in, in, uh, in AI startups. So quick overview of my, of my last startup. Um, it was called Paraquete Labs, and we had a fair, we had a fairly, you know, uh, grand vision in terms of extracting structure and meaning from uh, from humans uh, from human communication. So typically, human communication is 
uh, is unstructured and to sort of extract something structured out of it is, is a challenge. A lot, of a lot of unstructured communication is sort of just lost, unaccounted for. So we were, our goal was to add, bring, bring, up, bring about structure. And the first application uh, that we were building here was, was um, to do this, to apply this for email. Um, and um, the, uh, the product was called Inbox Voodoo, which was basically an email assistant that would, an AI powered email assistant. Uh, so one of, the, um, one of the challenges I was, I had, all, I had already been inv investing fairly actively before starting Inbox Voodoo. And one of the challenges I faced uh, as an investor is that I would, get, I would get a lot of emails, a lot of emails from entrepreneurs. And quite often I, uh, I would get these long rambling emails and there would be two or three lines in those emails which were, which were relevant, which would basically tell me something like, I'm, I'm an entrepreneur, I'm closing, I'm raising, this is, this is my startup, this is how much I'm raising, and this is when my round was closing, and this is how much I'm looking for. So what we uh, tried to do was actually try to take the, uh, try to extract the intent or the ask of the email and summarize that and show that in, an, in a way that was easy for the recipient to digest. So that was, uh, that was the essence of what we're doing, extracting uh, the ask in an email. So for we were trying to understand the intent of the, of the sender. I'll, I'll get into that in a little more detail. Uh, we were a team of, uh, we were a tech heavy team, uh, eight people, uh, five, five engineers. Um, only one of them had deep sort of NLP expertise, Duan, he had a PhD in NLP. The rest were actually a team of fairly generalist engineers who had the ability to pick up things quickly. Um, we had a data analyst and, um, and a head of product as well. Looking back, if I could do things with the team, we had a phenomenal technical team. Looking back, uh, I, if I could do things differently, we would, we, would get, we would sort of invest more in people to help us with user acquisition and growth. So I was the, I was the, only, I was the only person handling that. And there was a whole lot of, things that we did not do fast enough with, uh, with growth and with experimenting with user acquisition growth that I would do differently today if I were to uh, start this, if I could sort of move the clock back. Small team, but I, I love this quote from by, uh, by the CEO of Twilio, uh, which, which talks about how uh, you know, a, a small cohesive team can really do a lot of damage. So in, in terms of Paraquit, I spoke about, um, I briefly covered Inbox Voodoo, which was our uh, email assistant. Before that, we tried a bunch of uh, other products on top of our um, platform. So we had, built, we had built this platform, a natural language processing platform, which was capable of extracting uh, relevant text from, from a large corpus of text. So the, uh, in fact, the uh, first product that we built on this platform was called Intent Pulse, which was, uh, which was a product to get your status update highlights in your Facebook and Twitter feeds. Uh, I, was, I was getting a lot of, uh, as, a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a Twitter user and a Facebook user, I was beginning to get a lot of informa useful information in my Twitter feeds and in my Facebook feeds, but it was quite often just drowning in all that noise in that information and they'd be like one or two out of a hundred updates. They'd be like one or two updates that were relevant and time sensitive that I didn't want to miss. And uh, those would be just lost in the noise. So the, our first product was geared at trying to find the status updates that mattered. Um, one, one, one of the sort of the catalyst to start this was I'm a, a big fan of tennis. And a couple of uh, friends of mine were uh, at a tennis tournament and they, um, I saw that later on Facebook after the event, after the fact. And I asked them, why didn't you tell me about it? And they were like, dude, we posted it on Facebook. So it seemed like you know, the, the growing trend was, as, was just to broadcast all this information. So I thought it would be very, very useful to build something uh, that would um, uh, save me time, not have to go through a lot of, you know, a lot of noisy updates to find the ones that mattered. Um, so this was, this was one product we experimented with. 
Uh, and um, basically uh, what we found out was these updates that were about entities that were about products people were using, events they were going to, destinations they were traveling to, books they were reading. We found categories in those, at least as founders, we found categories in those um, updates in those categories more interesting. And my philosophy has always been if uh, given the size of the internet today, if there's something that's useful for you, there's a very good chance it can be useful for 100,000 other users. And worst case, I mean, you have, pro you have, you have you know, product market fit for at least one person. So that has been my sort of philosophy in, in general, in terms of um, building products. If I can build something that's useful for me and my 20 closest friends, that's a good start. Um, but here it did, it, the, this, this, this was, um, did not work in this instance with Intent Pulse. It, it turned out that the overlap of users who cared enough about their Facebook and Twitter status updates, but not enough to check it you know, all the time was very, very small. So the intersection was just not big enough uh, for a full-fledged product. And then um, we, we experimented with a product for book recommendations. It's the, um, the status updates we found that were about books, people discussing books, especially on Twitter, were very, were very, very high quality. We experimented with, with a book recommendations product that grew to a few hundred thousand users, got a lot of great sort of initial, got a lot of great uh, initial press coverage, et cetera. But still, that was also not enough for us to build a standalone company in the space. So one, one takeaway from, from, um, from our experience with BookVibe was that, you know, just because you get very, very, you know, super positive um, feedback from an early set of users, from the early adopters, does not mean you can create um, a standalone successful consumer product, um, especially, in a, especially in a category like books. So the third product we tried, so we were, we were, we were, we were quite experimental in trying to figure out what worked uh, on, our, um, um, on our NLP platform, the application that worked. The next application we built was Inbox Voodoo, and that was the application we eventually I landed up getting acquired for by Google. Um, so what was Inbox Voodoo? I think I, I covered that it was a personal email assistant. We would prioritize emails, we would summarize emails, and we also had features that would sort of make dealing with email a lot more efficient by providing uh, responses, smart replies that could sort of quicken, um, quicken responses. Yes, no, see you there, confirm that type of stuff. Um, we would, this is different types of emails. Happy to jump into this in more detail. Uh, if, if any of you have questions. And our longer term vision was to be a full fledged intelligent assistant. So we're starting with email to go into, to go into being a much smarter, um, all encompassing assistant. So had, had lots of, uh, very, very difficult, tedious problems to deal with. Uh, dealing with language because people express intent in a lot of different ways. So dealing with that was a huge sort of, was a very, very, you know, ugly, hairy problem at times. Uh, brief overview of our tech. We, we try, we experimented with a bunch of approaches. Um, we um, started off with an old school rules-based technique, which was um, easier to tweak, easier to read. Um, but also required manual intervention. And we also experimented with deep, with deep learning. It was the early days of deep learning in 2014, 2015, which was all the sort of rage back then. Uh, for us, we realized that our old school rules-based technique worked a lot better than, um, than a more sort of, you know, glamorous deep learning approach. The sheer amount of data that we needed to get deep learning working was just not practical for us at that time. So, um, you know, the, the lesson, the lesson, the key lesson from that was we, we actually landed up spending more time than we should have uh, trying deep learning. In the end, we settled for a hybrid approach with uh, we're taking some aspects from, from deep learning, but um, the rules-based approach was what uh, predominantly worked the best for us. Um, the other sort of key lessons learned from this was, um, uh, Sounds obvious, but have very, very clear product focus. 
in terms of um, uh, who you're sort of building this product for. We were, especially with something like email, which has a ton of, you know, different, a ton of nuances. Um, uh, looking back, we should have probably picked a, a specific category as opposed to coming up with a general purpose email productivity tool. Um, one company that had a lot of success in the space was a company called Relate IQ, which built, which built an email, um, which built a product and email was a part of that sort of Excel, uh, just for salespeople. Uh, and they were, um, they were acquired by Salesforce for about 400 million. And uh, technically it wasn't a very sophisticated product, but they sort of really nailed the use case and, uh, and also had an amazing UX as well for salespeople, really understood that domain really well uh, and built something very, so we were sort of trying to be more of an all purpose, general purpose productivity tool, which was much harder um, in terms of just the sort of the use cases we had to deal with. Uh, for uh, for in email uh, and then measuring improvement, especially when you're dealing with something like language, it's um, it, it's it's very it's, it's very very hard to get it uh, to get it perfect, and it can be frustrating when you sometimes when we would see that sometimes it was getting what seemed like very obvious detections, um, flagging emails that were very obviously not not actionable as an actionable email, getting you know getting false positives. So it can be uh, it can be demoralizing for the team after months and work months and months of working if you're if you're not sort of if you come back with what customers perceive to be basic mistakes. Uh, but you know just look at Siri. Uh, Siri still after you know hundreds and hundreds of millions of investment still can't get some sometimes can't get basic questions right. Um, so uh, for a startup, it's it's critical to sort of measure how you're improving. And to see that, so that it does it, it does not continue to become this sort of massive unwieldy problem that just keeps growing and growing. So we 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 did we we incorporated that, but we should have really focused on measuring improvement in the in the sectors that 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 mattered for us. We tended to use a more sort of academic way to measure improvement, something called the F1 score which looks at in machine learning, which looks at precision and recall. Whereas what, what we should have looked at was really what sort of constitutes improving in the sector that we are targeting. How accurate is it for our user group in terms of picking up actionable emails? Some of the challenges uh, we faced was uh, accessing to build any machine learning system. You need training data and accessing training data is very easy if you're building say, a classifier for web pages, where you have billions of publicly available web pages. We were building something for, for email and email data tends to be very private, uh, quite sensitive. So it is very, it is very, very hard to acquire, uh, to acquire email data. Uh, we landed up training, initially training our corpus um, based on Enron data. I don't know how many of you are familiar here with Enron, but Enron was this, it was, a, it was a massive this company, this energy company in the US. It was this massive scandal. And then their emails were deemed to be public domain. So a dream for sort of, you know, for machine learning scientists to be able to look at those, you know, those emails. And we were actually, we went through those emails, had a team, and we were man when we were we were labeling those emails. This is an urgent email, this is a non-urgent email, which is a, which was a great, which was great for a start. But one one challenge was it was not the most sort of relevant data set for our users. Enron users were these people at Enron. This was mostly the emails that were sent by the senior, the senior management team, Harvard MBAs using correct, you know, very sophisticated English. And um, whereas um, our users, our sort of initial user set was not that sort of technical in their use of the English language. It was sort of more colloquial, more real. So it was not the most sort of relevant user set to train our corpus on. So we landed up later on training it on, on internal company emails, on our own emails. And that worked a lot better for, for, our, for our target market. And the whole, um, and this is something that most startups underestimate, getting, getting clean label data is extremely tedious. This was now, nowadays we use Mechanical Turk, which provides people who can, uh, who can also label data once we started getting a larger email data set to be labeled. 
um, once once all the sensitive information was stripped off, we would we would use that we, we would use some of that to label uh, the label data. Um, but um, it was still that we had we had to spend a lot of uh, cycles getting the um, getting the process in place. Nowadays, it's a little it's it's much much easier. There are many companies that provide labeling as a service, uh, so that sort of lowers um, lowers this as a challenge. But for us, a few years ago, this was a massive challenge. Um, coming back to the general challenges, even getting getting access. So uh, email, getting access to email data in our case was was a challenge initially until until we started training it on our own emails. But it also can be very, it can also set up. So it's a double-edged sword. Um, if getting access to data is, is very, very easy, that means the barriers are also a lot lower. Any startup can do it. There's no sort of data moat. Uh, whereas for us, uh, once we uh, once we once we got access to the to the data and built something, it was actually um, quite a barrier to entry as well. So it's a double-edged sword. Uh, getting access to unique to a unique data set can be hard, but if you do if you do get access to that, it can be quite powerful, uh, and it's a barrier to entry for other startups. Um, AI learning techniques are now getting commoditized very very quickly. Um, so something some something that can differentiate your startup or a startup you invest in from the rest is access to proprietary or unique data. Um, and most important, the product still, no matter how bleeding edge or how advanced your AI is, most end users could care less about what the behind the scenes AI, uh, you still need to really focus on making the product intuitive and easy to use. I, uh, as an investor, I get a lot of pitches from, from companies, from founders that, Really hammer in the point that their AI is so advanced, but if uh, if they don't have a product end of the day that's useful and easy to use, it's not going to succeed. No matter how advanced or sophisticated their AI is. So that's the uh, that was sort of a quick overview of my lessons learned learned from Paraquete. We can go into quest some questions now, and then I can jump into some portfolio companies, or I can jump into some some of that now. Um, yeah, does anyone have any um, questions on sort of the learnings of an AI startup at this point then? Okay. Uh, so a few of my recent investments in AI startups. Um, so before that, a quick sort of overview of the types of AI startups. So there's core AI startups. A core AI startup would be something that actually helps the deployment of, AI, of the AI itself, building the AI itself. So for example, a startup that may provide uh, tools that help you with labeling, that help you build the AI in the first place. Um, then, there, then there are application AI startups. Um, so we, were, we started off a bit like an application AI startup. We had tech, a platform that could analyze text and it could be um, applied in different sort of industries. We built different sort of products on top of that. We built a product for book recommendations as I mentioned, we built a product for um, prioritizing emails. And then there's industry AI startups, which are applied to you know, AI for a specific business use case. So I would say 90% of the startups that are out there are typically you know, um, uh, industry AI uh, startups, AI for this or AI for, uh, AI for a specific use case. Yeah, I'll quickly go over my some of my recent focus on entrepreneur as well before getting into the some of my portfolio companies. So I'm also uh, the founder of a company that does that comes that's um, building sports AI solutions, and uh, we have built um, uh, using computer vision. We have built technology that can do event detection broadly speaking. So we have a we have a product for tennis, which quickly condenses a two hour tennis match into 20 minutes, the actual time that's, that's spent playing points. Uh, so essentially offering tools that uh, typically pro athletes have access to, to amateur athletes, but pro athletes can watch a highlight, can watch the highlights of a match uh, because it's shown on TV or it's recorded by someone. So we can offer similar tools to amateurs. We've also um, built products for rowing and we're experimenting with a product for golf as well, which essentially from, um, from a one hour session on a driving range, we'll sort of condense that into 30 swings 
with just the swings without all the wasted time that goes on. Uh, and also we want to just use your, use, of, uh, use your smartphone to do that as opposed to using sensors, hardware, or uh, expensive launch monitors. So uh, that's, what, that's what I'm working on now as an entrepreneur. Uh, we do have a question from um, Facebook that was okay. back actually. Um, so can you tell us how you went about the financing and pricing strategy for consumers? Right. So our, um, our strategy was we, were, um, we, we, went up, uh, we had a free version of the product. And then we also had a paid version, uh, which was um, for small businesses and teams. Um, so it was, a, it was basically a freemium model. Yeah. Thank you. So look, yeah. So as a, so this was um, it was which was which was a bit, which was quite tricky for us because um, uh, in terms of getting coming up with a uh, with a model here for the as a productivity tool, it was it was uh, it was quite difficult. Especially um, we found we found it a challenge to uh, to get people to pay ten bucks for a tool that would boost their email productivity. Uh, companies have now companies like Superhuman. Seem to be pulling it off now, which is which is amazing. But we we had a hard time uh, convincing people to pay uh, ten bucks a month for uh, for an email productivity tool. Um, which is why, looking back, I would have targeted a more specific vertical, such as email for sales professionals, where it's easier to justify charging you know, charging uh, businesses or sales professionals thirty to fifty bucks a month if it can help them. If if it can help, if it's a product that can help salespeople close more deals. Okay, some uh, companies, uh, some of my recent investments uh, in AI startups. Um, one of them is a company called uh, Kamua, which does uh, AI-based uh, video editing for market for marketers. So one one really sort of simple but interesting use case is all these brands that have built um, that have created videos on YouTube, and they the the formatting just does not work. There is there does not work. Uh, on Instagram stories, for example, these new channels. So using the very simple, so free, so editors have to spend a lot of time porting it, getting it to work on a different me, on a different channel. So using that tool, it's very, very, it automates a lot of the painstaking, um, you know, effort. And you, you, as a, as a video editor, you know, more, more of your time is freed up to work on the fun, creative stuff as opposed to the nitty gritty stuff. Um, so this is. Um, I was I was I was uh, I was quite impressed with their uh, with the founder, a, a deep experience working with brands, knew the domain well, uh, team with great technical chops, and um, they had they have, uh, really really good early traction amongst freelancers. Had they um, run a company before? Like, what other characteristics had they done that made you invest in them? In them, uh, so the the founder had uh, had not run it. it was a first time founder, but he had I had a ton of um, sort of management experience uh, and experience building teams from scratch at, at some of the bigger companies it worked for. So um, and the um, and his co founder had experience uh, uh, working at startups before. Yeah, does that does that answer? Okay. Yeah, no, that's fine. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, Headliner is another company uh, that I invested in. Um, this is um, in the in the podcasting space, and they make it uh, really easy to select relevant clips from a from a long podcast. It's a tool targeted at publishers. So one reason um, I've not used podcasts as much as I probably should is because it takes a long time to find that one clip you're interested in there's no sort of still there's no real good preview for a podcast and that's what um that's what these guys are doing uh and um it's also what they do that's really that's really cool is um you're on a web page reading an article about say investing in startups they'll pick a relevant clip from a podcast in that article so really enhancing the uh the user experience and a tool and a way for both the podcasters and publishers to monetize better. Um, here, this this one of the uh, why did I invest in this company? The I was an early investor. In fact, the first investor in the founder's previous company, 
which had a successful exit. He sold the company. It was a content recommendation company. So he's been, um, he was, he's been immersed in the space for a while. Uh, and he uh, knows what it takes to sort of take a company from inception to a successful exit. This was a company sold to, um, to IAC um, for two years after he started it. So he's, um, he's, had, he's had that first successful exit and now he's looking, he's, now, he's, uh, now he's actually swinging for the fences, looking for something really big. So uh, AMP Control is a recent investment uh, in a very, very, very exciting space. Uh, and so I think uh, an overlooked space uh, so, um, simple but valuable using, uh, you know, AI powered um, uh, EV charging software to optimize EV charging. Um, one of the founders really was worked for worked for an automobile company before. Understands understands the domain really well. Has a really really good team. Really has put together a really good tech team as well. So in terms of my uh, investment criteria, um, it's it's very hard to predict. So uh, what's going to work? Uh, and and uh, before once once you launch something, once you get you can do all the analysis before. But once you actually get something out there, you'll always learn something new. So I think it's very very important to be experimental uh, in figuring out what's going to work. But uh, you also in the first place you also need to be product thoughtful. Uh, so you're not you know you're not just taking a lot of sort of random, you know, random bets all the time. Um, the, other, the other factor is I think founders always underestimate how difficult and tough uh, user acquisition is today. Uh, I think I touched on that in terms of you may have all the AI in the world, but if you don't have a credible plan for user acquisition, that makes it very, um, that's a big red flag. Um, it's very hard to predict that as well, but at least you should have a plan and if, uh, if you have done some sort of experiments that tell you this is how much you're spending to acquire one user, and this is how much we expect to make off of one user, that is a lot more compelling to me than you know, market sizing and sort of the overall sort of macro look. So I, like, I, I tend to prefer more of a bottoms up approach as opposed to something that's like a GDP forecast that tells you we'll get 1% of this mark of a $10 billion market. How are you going to get your first thousand users and how are you and how much are you going to spend to get those, to get those users? And then um, I think the most important factor is, uh, is, is founders who really want to go for something, for something meaningful uh, in terms of the outcome that, that they want to create um, and to make sure it sort of makes sense as an investor because startups are, startups are risky. And if in the best case, if, if let's say I'm coming in at a $5 million valuation, entry valuation, and if in the best case, the founder is gonna take the first $10 million offer that comes their way, it's a two X return for me in the best case as an investor. And that quite often does not make sense. So you want founders who are sort of gonna make uh, an, a, a real attempt at going for something meaningful. I think uh, that's that's most of it. I have a bunch of other slides, you know, more technical slides in the appendix. Um, but and uh, but happy to jump into questions now. Now that sounds great. Thanks very much. That was fabulous. If you unshare your screen then, and then people can see you, and we can start unmuting. And sure. feel free to ask any questions um, about whether it's the investment criteria, but more. I have a few there myself. Uh, the actual AI in depth stuff, or actually startups in general, and the challenges faced. I have a, a question. If I can jump in in front of everybody, um, thank thank you, Ramesh. A really great presentation. Um, my name is Chris Rodley. I'm from Snap IT. Um, I noticed that you've designed, in the case of Forty Live, you've designed an AI to solve a specific, really clear, uh, targeted um, outcome, and then you also have the rowing startup. So I imagine you're taking a similar tech stack and just reapplying that into another uh, entity. Is that is that correct? Yes, yes. So good. Yeah. So it's a strategy that we're also using in my company. And so you've you've you have an IP sharing. Can you do you mind just talking briefly about how that how that works between those entities? Because it looks like they're separate entities. So, so it's that, no they're not. They're actually all part of the same. So, uh, the, so the name of the company is Slice Backend. We started off with a very heavy sort of tennis focus. 
uh, but they're all owned by Slice Backend. Uh, all these, they're, so there are three products within the same entity. Yeah, I think it'd be, it would be very complicated and messy, it, um, in, in my opinion, to sort of spin them off into different companies. So good, thank you. Yeah, it's really yeah. helpful. Any other, yeah, uh, I have a question as well. Yep. <laughs> awesome. Thanks for sharing your experiences. It's um, really helpful, I think, for those of us at the outset to try and learn the easy way. <laughs> um, sure. So my question is around um, the key sort of points where you see the company really increasing in value, um, both from an investor side and from your experience and as a founder. Um, so it seems, you know, maybe like first thousand users is one of those. What other sort of uh, things should um, entrepreneurs be shooting for to really increase the value of their companies? To, to increase value, um, mm -hmm. so depending on the depending on the on the on the market um, you're targeting, uh, there's sort of different sort of benchmarks for um, you know enterprise SaaS companies, for example, versus a versus a consumer versus a consumer company. So a lot depends on on the market you're targeting. I think if you're if you're looking which which sort of uh, market are you considering are you looking at yeah we make uh, search engines and uh, data visualization for scientists that's uh, oh, what my company okay. does yeah okay okay so in, so um my guess is in there's there's probably a higher willingness to pay in in that uh in that market as a very sort of targeted segment um for consumer apps the bar is a lot higher so i think i briefly touched on um book vibe which is a book recommendations mm -hmm. product for that mm -hmm. to have been really interesting to investors, we, yeah. we had a few hundred thousand users, just not interesting enough if your sort of revenues are gonna come from, primarily we, we had two revenue, so two revenue streams, um, affiliate revenues from mm -hmm. Barnes and Noble or Amazon, or um, a tool for self-published authors to, to promote themselves. So the bar was very, very high for to, to even raise a series A around millions of users. So it depends. It, it depends in uh, in different categories. Um, so I, uh, for me uh, um, personally, as an investor, since I do very early stage stuff, um, a few thousand users uh, for uh, if if the if the valuation is right, is, uh, is 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 a good start. And and I think what's what's really more important than anything else is the trajectory, the shape of the graph. Mm. Yeah. Got it. Cool. And um, yeah, one other area that we've looked at in this sort of targeting, you know, where that's going to increase value is the technology. But as you've sort of said, uh, would it be fair to say that technology without some sort of validation uh, in a use case is, is really not worth that much? Yes, yeah. So um, yeah, that's that's something I learned um, after 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 in, after my last experience, my 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 last startup. Um, it is, um, the, yeah, the, your value is because so many startups, so many companies nowadays that make tall claims as well. It's very hard if you don't have users, it's very hard to, harder mm -hmm. to validate those claims. Mm -hmm. um, there's, as, as I mentioned, a lot of these, a lot of tech is getting commoditized. Uh, it's easier and easier to, to, um, for people to, uh, to, to build products on top of hard tech. Mm -hmm. um, I, as an investor, I used to uh, this, so my strategy has changed. In the early days of my investing, when I first started about 15 years ago, there were there weren't that many um, you know hardcore hard companies or even companies that made claims that they had that they had revolutionary right. tech. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that that that's number has just gone up. So uh, I always used to think that if it was an, if the if the entry valuation was right, if there was a really good core team, uh, it could be it could be sold to a larger mm -hmm. company for the tech alone. But yep. nowadays, those types of acquisitions are getting much, much harder to get to sell to sell a startup right. for just for the core tech. Uh, there mm -hmm. are exceptions, of course, but in general, it's just much, much harder today. Right. Okay. Cool. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sure. Just on the investing side, Ramesh, um, what? How are you going to help the New Zealand companies? What? What? What is it that you can offer the New Zealand companies when it comes to sort of connections um, to other investors, or actually even if they're trying to go into that growth phase because you're starting at the startup end? What is it that mm -hmm. you know? How are you going to help the companies along the way on their journey? Yeah. So I think um, um, 
based uh, looking at looking at companies in the UK, for example, when I look when I compare them with companies in the um, in the valley, I think one uh, one factor that uh, separates um, valley companies, the top companies in the valley, is how um, um, how much sort of more sophisticated they are when it comes to Europe compared to say European companies in general when it comes to growth. So they are just just far more. Uh, they've just have people on their teams quite often that have um, many of them might have worked for a Facebook, might have worked for an Uber. So they just have much more sort of familiarity in terms of tactics that can drive growth. I'm sort of generalizing in, in uh, here. But um, um, so just, so I think um, connecting, connecting people um, in, in New Zealand with people in the Valley who, uh, who understand growth uh, is something I can do. Um, connecting them with, um, with investors who have actually, who have run companies before. Uh, so I was, uh, so I was, I was actually quite very fortunate in my case that one of the, one of our, uh, one of our seed investors, uh, David Jeske, was someone who had sold a company to Google before. So I was able to um, get it. Uh, so we were able to uh, present to Google and have, and, um, and um, have a chance to pitch Google in the first place because of that. Uh, so had we not had, yeah, had we not had that sort of a, um, you know, access to people at, at Google, uh, it would have been much, much harder, uh, may not have been possible. So that's something I can try to do, I have a good network in the Valley. Um, this is, uh, this is sort of, I think it, this, this sort of tends to be, if a startup has, you know, tens of millions of users, then these things are less, less valuable. But if a, startup is sort of, if a startup is sort of in that range where they've not really quite sort of, you know, they're not quite a rocket ship yet. I think in those situations, these sort of connections and introductions are much more valuable. So that's something I can help with um, having, you know, um, gone through the whole process, starting a company, raising rounds from um, most of them were um, were investors who had also been operators before. So I've got a, I've got a very good network there um, when it comes to uh, people that can add value as investors. Hmm. Nice. Yeah, that was actually going to be one of my next questions was um, how do you get in front of your potential acquirer? So you think one of the key things is actually having someone on your team or in that close network who has actually um, been part of that organization or sold to that company, had some sort of connection. So yeah, you think that's, that's an that, absolute must. That, yeah, that, that, yeah that, that's a huge help. Um, you, I mean, you can do it in other ways as well. They're more sort of um, organic. If, if someone on there, let's say you, let's say you have a deep, you have a, you have a technical company uh, and someone on your tech team knows has worked someone on the, um, tech side, I'd say, let's say you're speaking to Twitter, someone on the tech side of Twitter has used your product, is familiar with them. So when someone on the business side speaks to someone on the tech side for validation, they'll be like, yeah, we know those guys, makes a big difference. So it can happen, but these sort of, it's just a, it's just a little easier if you have someone who can give you that credibility when it comes to an introduction, just because there's so many more startups today. Okay. It's just harder to stand out, yeah, yeah. Hi, Michelle. Michelle, can I ask a question? Can you ask one? Go for it. Hi there. Oh, you know, I'm so happy to be here today. Uh, my name's Lane, and uh, we're Chatterize. And what we do at Chatterize is we build conversational chatbots that live in a virtual world and help young Chinese kids speak English with confidence. Uh, so oh, the cool. question, yeah. So the question I have uh, is the way that we've gotten started is that we've uh, just plugged in a speech to text engine. Right, and uh, we plugged in a speech to text engine instead of building it ourselves uh, after a, a quite a bit of debate in the beginning. Uh, and then we focused on the user experience of it all, right, to prove out the concept. And I'm wondering, uh, what is your opinion about kind of building out the technology before you prove the product itself and the concept itself? How much effort did you guys put into doing that? Would you do it differently if you could pull something off the shelf? Right. And, uh, you know, mm -hmm. I'm just always, always kind of thinking about at what point is the, we're collecting data, right? So like the good sure. thing is we have a way to collect data. I'm just always thinking about at what point is the right point for us to start to build our own engines. We, mm -hmm. uh, our target market is four to 12 year old uh, Chinese kids speaking English, mm -hmm. right? So like, it's always a difficult mm -hmm. ask for an off the shelf mm -hmm. engine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. So if it's uh, if it's not really if it's not really core, uh, especially in the early days to the overall mm-hmm. product, if the tech is not really that core, uh, I wouldn't spend too much time building, you know, tweaking the model, building, um, you know, and uh, a really uh, spending too much effort building an in-house model there. I would sort of be very, I would use whatever you can be very, you know, do, do something quick, more quick, quick and dirty on the tech side. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and then one, if it's, but if, if you were, if you were to tell me that the tech is, that the tech is a core part of the product, then I'd spend more time up front in, uh, in the, in the model there, investing, investing in the tech. So how core you- is that? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, the, the, our product innovation is that we provide, you know, over 80% more spoken opportunity than any other language learning product on the market, right? So it is core in that we are a conversational world where people can practice their oral, ling- oral English, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but, it, but it is that also, um, you know, I'm just wondering if, because we have a lot to do. <laughs> we have a yeah. lot to do. We've got the Chinese market to deal with. We're a business to consumer company. We also have like a user interface for children, you know, who can't read, right? Um, and so I just uh, sometimes wonder if building our artificial intelligence engines anytime soon will create a situation where we'll never be better than a company who would just solely focus on that. Like how, yeah, do, you, how do you split resources? It's a, it's a tricky one. So looking back, we would definitely not spend so much time. Uh, we spent way too much time trying to get the system to be very precise. Mm. Um, and so um, it was all about, you know, uh, surfacing urgent emails. So I felt that as a, as a user, if the system um, sent me a notification and the email was not urgent, I just never use it again. So my, my sort of personal bar was very high in terms of how accurate it needed to be, but it didn't mm-hmm. need to be, it didn't looking back, it didn't need to be, it, we, we, we could have sort of gotten something as long as we had messaged it correctly. Mm-hmm. Especially for our initial users, because we would have, because our initial, our early users were actually providing us good feedback, wanted to help us. So we try to sort of, we set the bar too high on on accuracy, as opposed to have gotten something out there quicker and tweaked it based on that. Um, okay. Yeah. So that was that. That's what that's what we did in terms of uh, spending too much time initially trying to get the technology right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for that. I really sure, appreciate it. Sure. Sure. Any other questions, team? So going forward then, Ravish, um, looking at the New Zealand market, um, if you were going to invest in some New Zealand companies, um, how is it best that people contact you? Do you want to put your email address in the yeah, chat? Yeah, email. And, yeah, yep, e- email. put that in email the chat and people yeah. cut and paste it. Um, yeah. And what other ways can uh, folks help you in the New Zealand ecosystem? Oops, oh, oops. Uh, so DM'd it. To see more deal flow, yeah, what would yeah, you yeah, like yeah. to see? Yeah, so one, one area I'm obviously, I'm, I'm very interested is in uh, is the sports AI. I'm working um, in, in that area. So uh, startups in that space, um, I'd be I'd be very interested in uh, in in that area. AI appli- uh, application AI j- companies in general um, is interesting. Um, even even core AI companies building stuff in in that category. Um, what else? I think the, the for me the, the in in terms of yeah as I said the the in terms of criteria the most important factor is founders who have a, a credible plan for user acquisition. That is the that is the most important um, uh, factor in terms of criteria. Um, let's see um, what other sectors am I interested in? Um, health tech. I'm looking at that uh, area as 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 I as I get older, I want to start you know use use products that will sort of improve the quality of my life. Uh, uh, stay healthy. That's an area. Productivity, as I mentioned, is an is an area that I've I was immersed in. Uh, I still like that area, even though it's even though it's a hard area to monetize. Um, what else? Um, Are you willing crypto. to do follow-on okay. rounds? Like, how far through the um, investment journey will you go with one of your companies? Or yeah, I'm 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 open to it. Uh, I typically like coming in really really early stage. 
So if it's, um, so when a company gets to a series A stage, et cetera, uh, I typically don't follow on, um, but I'm, I'm, I'm open to it. Yeah. Uh, typical uh, between 50,000 and 100,000 US dollars. It's nice so when you my, convert yeah. that to New Zealand. <laughs> yeah, that's a, so it's uh, it's uh, typically don't don't come on as a lead investor. It is um, uh, in the U.S. that would be a hundred thousand dollar investment would typically be about the typical seed round is about a million to two million dollars. So it's about ten percent of the seed round of the overall round in the U.K. The typical seed round tends to be closer about four hundred thousand pounds, about half a million dollars. So a fifty thousand dollar investment is about ten percent of that. I used to be take. Uh, put in li write larger checks, uh, negotiate terms, um, be the take board seats, uh, but I don't do that anymore. I just don't have the time for that since I'm also running my own startup. Mm -hmm. Nice. Um, that's, that's actually really good intel to know that uh, you'd prefer to syndicate with others and have someone else do the lead and do the DD. Yeah, good intel. Yes, yeah, that's, 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 that's typical, but, I've, but, I've, uh, but having said that, I'm also, if uh, I'm, uh, I'm not afraid to be the first investor, uh, and uh, I'm, I'm happy to consider coming on uh, as, you know, even at a pre-stage, uh, pre-seed uh, uh, stage uh, as the first investor or the only investor in a smaller round, if there's a pre-seed round they want to do. Some of my best investments have actually been uh, uh, deals where, where I've been the only investor uh, and, uh, and without any other investors. So I'm open to that as well. Okay. Yeah. Ramesh, yeah, um, a, thanks yeah. a lot. Thanks a lot for for the session. Really appreciate it because you're so open. You know, also in sh you know sharing what worked, what didn't work. I really think that's uh, very helpful. And um, in fact, my question was uh, so it's related a little bit how uh, you you know how you could support the New Zealand ecosystem from a, let's say mentoring perspective because we have many. We have many, many ventures in EHF who are interested in the area and who have uh, who have started to work in it. Like Kyle, Kyle is uh, on the on the call. He was part of the huddles as well. And um, and I was wondering, are you open to do some mentor sessions? You know, on areas which would fall into your area without necessarily investing. It could lead to investment if you think it's interesting, but. You know, just help some of the ventures to to get you know to get some of your experience. Yes, absolutely. You know, I'd I'd like to uh, I'd like to get I'd really like to get plugged in to the New Zealand uh, startup ecosystem. Uh, I was actually hoping to have moved to New Zealand in August to be uh, I was I was I'd, I'd been planning on moving to Queenstown, so um, uh, I haven't been able to get as involved remotely as I would as I would have liked to. So definitely something I, I, um, I, I'd love to do. Nice. So I yeah. on that yeah. one. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Well, we'll run out of time unless there's one more question that someone would like to do. Uh, I've got one little sort of MISC question that popped up earlier. Um, so you described a situation where you had an engineering heavy team uh, and looking back, you wish you had had like a little bit more focus on growth. Um, yeah. In terms of, um, say, hires or team, what would that ideal person have been? The ideal person for growth or the idea, ideal composition? Uh, I guess the ideal person that you would have added or the way you'd change your team to sort of focus it more on growth. Focus, focus it uh, potentially one of the um, one more. Yeah, it, that's a very good question. I, I would I wouldn't replace any of the people on the engineering team that was also yeah yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's, a, it's, a very, it's, it's a very good question um I would get a team of 10 I would have at least two people on group okay. yeah right. yeah cool and uh you sort of mentioned with Silicon Valley that it was much more common to have I don't know more focus on growth is it materializes yeah. people whose core skill set is is that user acquisition and growth yeah, there's the, yeah, there are people there uh, who are you you, you have, I think most startups there as well fail. They can't crack growth, mm. so growth yeah. is, growth is difficult even there. I think the difference is there are more people with experience in growth thanks to mm. all these all these companies that have grown you know enormously mm. over the years. Someone who has worked who has worked at Instagram or someone who yeah. has been 
uh, at Twitter in the early days, uh, at LinkedIn, all these. So it's, it's easier to have, to get access to people who understand, who understand growth. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Cool. Great. Thank you. Ramesh, I've got one question that's come in th from Facebook that says they're looking yeah. at starting an AI company, but they were surprised you didn't list patented idea or patent pending as a criteria. Do you feel safe investing if that's not, uh, if they're not patented? Yeah, I, 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 yeah, yeah, I, uh, I feel, I know some investors love it. Um, many acquirers like it too. Personally, uh, to me, it's not a big factor. It, it, is, an, it, is, it is a nice to have. But uh, personally, I find it quite um, a bit annoying, actually, when, when startups sort of overemphasize that early on. Um, and when, they, when they talk about IP, in general, it takes years for, for, to get these for patents to be granted. Um, so it's, it's a nice to have, uh, but not a criteria for me. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for your time. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Um, our next live session we have in February is uh, Investor Fellow Mark Brigman. He's been interviewed by Investor Fellow Chris Wake from Atypical. And we'll also have another session that was postponed from uh, earlier in, um, in the month because of um, speakers having to get called away to governments. And that's about innovation and how does New Zealand look at innovation to create jobs in that in the regions, which we'll have a few fellows on a panel being interviewed by Peter Crabtree from MB. So thank you for joining us and thank you, Ramesh, for staying up for us and you can now go home. <laughs> yeah, okay. Thank you very much, Michelle. Enjoy thanks, your evenings, thanks, enjoy your day. Thanks, thank you. Thanks all. Thanks a great, lot. Really, really enjoyed it. Great questions. Looking forward to meeting you know, all of you in person soon. <laughs>